Welcome to the fourth edition of the Cybersecurity Monthly Tips. And today we'll be talking about business continuity and backup. Um, as we have gone through March, April, and May, you can see that we started with security assessments and technology policy, laying the fundamental uh, underpinnings of what you should be doing so that you can secure your business. Uh, in April, we talked about passwords and multi-factor authentication with all the good points on how to manage your passwords properly and secure your accounts online. And maybe worked on to protecting data with remote users, which is certainly something with the pandemic going on that has been um, very much front of mind for a lot of businesses. Today, we're looking at business continuity and backup. As chaos reigns around the world, we are now considering business continuity planning and having the necessary fundamentals in place so that you can deal with anything that pops up, whether it be COVID-19, floods and fire, Pretty much Brisbane's been a uh, hot pot for a lot of these over the last 10 or 20 years. So having a business that can weather those changes and uh, work through them and come out the other end doing well is what we're after. So as you can see, we've got a few more going on in this year. So feel free to pop in once a month and listen to us talk about that. Um, today, we also have Matt C from WatchGuard. Say hello to the people, Matt. Everyone, apologies, I was muted. Uh, not a problem. We will move on, but feel free to interject any stories that you have, as I know you have many. So today's agenda is business continuity planning, uh, incident response, and finally finishing up with backups themselves. So what is business continuity? The, uh, I guess, basics of business continuity is keeping your business running through risk assessment, uh, planning for when things happen, and the disaster recovery itself. And this isn't just a technological discussion, but it covers the entirety of your business, whether that be finance, staffing, pretty much everything. Uh, there are a number of disasters that can stop your business. Technology can certainly play a part in helping get through those, but it is the, uh, the total business operation that we're concerned about here. So I don't feel that this is just a technology thing. It certainly is something that the whole of business needs to be behind. So there are a number of areas that can con uh, constitute a disaster, whether that be a cyber breach, computing infrastructure failure, unavailability of a key vendor. If you've got a single supplier and they go down, that certainly constitutes a disaster. I guess in the legal area, that may not be much of a concern, but if you're using a online cloud-based solution that hosts all of your data, having them as a key vendor go down is certainly going to make a massive impact to how you can run your business day to day. Loss of utilities, whether that be power, phones, internet, transport, um, even water for air conditioning. I worked for a business that had hosted servers in a data center in Brisbane uh, in a very well-known building at number one Eagle Street. And they lost the water to that building in the middle of the summer. And that caused their data center to overheat. So certainly water in Queensland can be a fairly large factor to having your business continue to run. And fire, floods, storms, certainly floods for Queensland. Those are a fairly big environmental impact that pops up. And don't forget social. Yeah, we have rioting overseas. We have the pandemic and we'll never know if we have a zombie apocalypse or not, but we might as well be prepared for everything. So what isn't business continuity? I guess the first one on this is backups. Business continuity isn't just backups. It is a part of it, don't get me wrong, but it is just a small part. The cloud also is not business continuity. Moving your data to the cloud does not give you business continuity. It is just purely another way to operate your business and it carries along with it all the other risks that need to be factored into the business continuity plan. Effectively, it's the same as running your data on site. You're just moving that risk off to someone else and you have to make sure that they're following through on what they need to do to keep your data protected so that your business can keep running. And lastly, disaster recovery planning is a piece of business continuity, but it isn't the be all and end all. It's certainly nice to plan for disasters, but you've got to do everything else to make sure that you're doing it right. 
So why are we here today? Well, with the current impact to business operations that COVID has put upon us, we're basically in a situation where business continuity for a lot of businesses has been interrupted. You know, we're here to make sure that businesses can remain resilient and work through these situations. There's a number of businesses that have had to adjust and you know, whether they've enacted a disaster or have just called it a situation that they've got to work through, there has been an impact and a negative one and they've had to move through that. So business continuity planning can protect your business assets and more importantly, your reputation as well. Nothing worse than someone picking up the phone and going to call your business and either not getting through or getting through and being told well, our systems are down, there's not much we can do about it. So the other one is boosting employee morale. You know, as part of this, you have staff that work for you and showing that you have a good business continuity plan that actually factors in how they're going to operate in any of these disasters does show those staff that you care about them and you care that the business keeps running so that they can remain employed as well. And regularly requ regulatory requirements. So that's certainly a big thing when it comes to the legal fraternity and it's something that needs to be kept in mind but that's probably the last priority on this list you know there are certainly other reasons to keep running your business not just to cover your bum for the regulation side of it but purely to keep a good business keep it working and keep doing the right thing and the last thing we want to do here is use this to demonstrate to the wider community your social responsibility so in this day and age certainly showing that you aren't just there for yourselves but you're there for your clients and your staff and the community that you work in is a big part and parcel of this so those are the reasons that we're here discussing business continuity so the reason for my gray hairs these are two great examples that have sort of popped up uh, in my past experience and that certainly showed to me that business continuity planning is, is a fairly big thing that uh, in client one's example was done right and in client two's example, maybe not quite as good as it could have been. So client one was a financial services company that I worked as their IT manager and it was during the 2011 Brisbane floods. So we were located in South Bank and on Tribune Street, and it was a fairly interesting day when the floods came through. So we saw the news, we knew what was happening. It wasn't an unusual occurrence for Brisbane to have floods. It was an unusual occurrence that these floods were you know, fairly major. We were watching as you know, the river started to slowly creep up on South Bank and start sucking the South Bank um, Park into the river. And we were seeing reports of services starting to close down. It was about two o'clock that we decided to enact our business continuity plan and start our incident response. So we basically sat down and said, you know, uh, look what's going on, where's things going? Our biggest worry was actually getting staff home. Uh, we had a number of staff in our building and closing the building and being able to get everyone home was the biggest worry of the day. So we ended up closing just after two and sending everyone to work home from remotely. Unfortunately, as things started to go for the rest of that day and the next, uh, our offices became flooded as did a number around Brisbane and power was actually lost to the building. So we did lose power to a number of our systems during that. And that was certainly a, an area that we weighed up what we wanted to do uh, in the future when we went back and reviewed what happened. But we did lose a lot of productivity. Um, we couldn't have our staff working you know, what would be considered a normal job and that was a big impact for us but having the planning in place allowed us to you know actively look at those systems that we needed you know how could we scale back on some areas and keep other areas running and just keep that business ticking along you know we weren't the only you know, only business in Queensland that had been affected so it was a, a known thing going on but having the planning allowed us to weather that and come out the other end and actually do quite well where I know a number of other businesses weren't able to you know deal with the impact quite as successfully so it goes on to client two this was a small family-owned retailer who had a crypto locker attack you know they thought they were doing well and had the right things in place they had firewalls they had backups they had antivirus 
you know, they were checking everything was working, but the one thing they hadn't done was actually checked that their backups were restoring properly. And because of that, when it came to actually going through and, and getting them back up and running after they were hit, uh, it took them about a month to become fully operational again. And it was a fairly, uh, uh, the first week wasn't a fun week, you know, being able to go back to the client and say, this is the data we've managed to recover and it's not all of it. Uh, this is what we've lost where do we go from here and how's it going to affect your business so it just goes to show that having a plan that's in place and managed well and checked as it goes on is a better thing than just doing what you think is right um, not having a plan and never checking it but those are two of uh, the uh, most prominent uh, situations that I've had with clients in the past sort of 10 years, but there has been a, a very large number. And certainly in the last few months, COVID-19 has brought uh, many out of the out of the woodwork. It's uh, a fairly you know, large event that's on a global scale. And it's something that a lot of businesses now are starting to come to grips with. So here are a few facts that just go to show, you know, why we're doing this you know 75 percent of small businesses don't have a business continuity plan and this isn't hard to do they're not that complex it is really just sitting down discussing and having something written up and then going through on a regular basis just to make sure that everyone's you know, across it and that it is comprehensive enough to deal with what you want 45 percent of failures are from hardware you know, People aren't replacing servers on time or they've not factored in that hardware will actually die regardless. Things happen and working with that, you know, whether you've got you know, details on a laptop and you've not factored in that those are actually critical to the business and having that die or you know, whether it be just a old piece of hardware that's finally failed, it happens and it's just a part of running a business, which is why we recommend that people do have managed life cycles and replacing equipment before it fails, not as it fails. It certainly makes things a lot easier. Uh, the big one, 63% of businesses reported a ransomware attack, attack that led to business threatening downtime. Uh, as much as hardware failures do account for the largest portion of downtime, we are seeing other things like ransomware starting to make a, a big impact on business continuity. It certainly makes a big impact on the cost for businesses, but you know, being down for a week, a month, as you recover from a attack is certainly a lot of time for a business to work through. And 50% of companies have experienced downtime lasting longer than a full workday. We've found a lot of businesses can weather a work day pretty well. You know, they can answer phones, they can take notes and they can tell people that they can get back to them tomorrow. But when that day turns into two, three a week, it starts to make a significant impact on their business. And over 50% lasting longer than a full work day just goes to show that the impacts are quite large out there. You can't expect a small power outage of a couple hours that you get through. You know, the likelihood is that it may be some of those, but it's probably going to be a larger one that comes along as well. And 93% of companies that lost their data for 10 days or more filed for bankruptcy within one year of the disaster and 50% filed for bankruptcy immediately. That just goes to show that the business continuity planning is paramount to actually keeping your business. If you're down for that significant period of time, you, know, you are down for a week or longer, the impact is going to be significant and the likelihood of being around after that isn't particularly good. So this is why we're here. Business continuity planning helps to alleviate a lot of these issues and pushes you into the few percentages there that can come out of it with a good chance of doing well. And you know, I wouldn't want to be a retail business at the moment and seeing what the hospitality sector is going through, it's certainly something that you know, they probably wouldn't have thought would have happened, but having a plan in place, and a lot of them are dealing with it, just you know, having to deal with it because they don't have much of a choice. And a lot of them are going bankrupt. It is kind of sad, but that is the environment we're in. And that is why we're here to discuss this and hopefully help you guys out with a little bit of a step in the right direction. So we have talked through the other three about the NIST cybersecurity framework. This is designed to provide the underpinning areas to look at as you process all these cybersecurity issues through identifying what they are, protecting those assets, detecting when something happens, responding to it and recovering it. 
business continuity covers these areas which we think are fundamental and certainly show that the respond and recover is where this B, the BCP comes into effect. Now, what is in your business continuity plan? So we believe there are five parts to this that need to be uh, worked through to ensure that you have a good business continuity plan. That is a risk management planning area that deals with the risks, putting them down, going through the process of risk management and ensuring that you have an idea of what's there. This is an ongoing and constant thing as risks change and evolve over time. We've got a business impact analysis, which ensures that not only do you know those risks, but you know the areas of your business and how they could be impacted and work out what that impact means to you. The incident response plan is basically what happens when things do go wrong and you enact it and decide how you're going to react to that. Then you have a communication plan for you know, not just during an incident response, but throughout the entire part of the business continuity planning process to ensure that you have those people who are involved and know what's going on, both inside and external to your business. I see a lot of businesses these days are actually post posting up their business continuity plans publicly to show to the greater community that they are there. Uh, as an example of a business recently that had some issues with their freight, you know, um, Toll hasn't done particularly well. This is the second time they've been hit by a ransomware attack and they, funnily enough, do not have their business continuity plan online published. So they've got a lot of their other HR plans and policies published online, but not their business continuity plan. And I wonder if that's a little bit of a, a telling insight into where it factors into their business and why they're having so many issues. And lastly, the testing and evaluation schedule. A plan is only as good as whether you've tested it out, and we recommend that it's done at least annually. And in our business, we do that quarterly just to make sure that we've covered for you know, whatever might happen. So the first part, risk management planning. The, I guess, stages for this are listing all your potential risks down, you know, putting down on paper what you think is likely to hit you. This is a fairly you know, living list and will change over time based on what your business is and where it's located and how you operate. But it's a good idea to get something on there. You know, you're probably not going to be comprehensive just because there's so many risks out there that you may not have thought of. I don't think COVID-19 and a pandemic was on very many people's planning at this point but at least it gives you a start to figure out what could come along and the sort of impacts and likelihood and consequences of those risks. And that moves on to the other two areas, likelihood, you know, how likely is this to happen? You know, flooding in Queensland is certainly something that's probably likely to happen. It's happened a number of times before, so it's worth you know, factoring in that that's a reasonably high likelihood and the consequences of those risks. You know, what are they going to do to your business? Will your business stop running? Will your business keep going? You know, what is going to be the outcome and you know, how much damage, what's it going to cost? You know, if you had a fire in your office, what's that going to be as a consequence? You know, would you be able to survive? You know, what would be damaged? Just sit down and, and start mapping these out. This is something that you will get better with over time and start to get a bit of a feel for it. Ensuring you have a process to monitor those risks and evaluate any new risks. We believe that this is probably the biggest part of this, it is a living you know, document. You will get new risks. Your risks will change. What you've already listed as a risk and its likelihood and consequences are likely to be adjusted over time as well. So having that process, whether it be something you bring up annually or on a more frequent basis where as a risk is identified, it's added to the risk register and you do a likelihood analysis and consequences on that so that you can start building up what the business risks are and start being able to mitigate those as you move forward. And as, as I've said, this needs to be something that's undertaken as a regular process, at least annually. And something that was pointed out to me by um, Matt is the data center in New Zealand that hosts a, a number of clients and government facilities there. You know, they had a major fault that took them down. You know, having your risk you know, moved off to a third party and hopes to outsource that may not necessarily be something that's a smart or a good opportunity and needs to be factored into that risk management planning. Yeah, as I said, 
I like you, the fact that you've got that in there, David. I was actually in uh, New Zealand. It's Matthew, by the way. I was in New Zealand at the very time this happened. And it was incredible because I experienced a number of uh, customers who actually had all of their assets. They'd moved all of their assets into the data center thinking it's going to be there. It's going to be more secure than having it in my environment. It'll always be there. That was the fatal assumption. Companies who had put everything in there were down and they were down for a number of days. Companies who actually put some of their assets into the cloud, into that data center, but held back on some primary assets were able to keep running. And that was a critical learning factor for a lot of people. They just simply didn't expect that a company like IBM, a major data center, could actually go down. And you know, Google has had issues where they've had outages, Microsoft as well. So just you know, handing it on to one of these guys is no guarantee. And it's something that a lot of people did not expect. Uh, certainly true. You know, you're outsourcing your risk. You're not removing the risk completely. And you know, even in a data center with multiple systems, it's not unknown for them to completely fail or have cascading failures that bring them down eventually. And unfortunately, that is the world we, we live in. You know, having multiple baskets to put your eggs in is certainly the better way to do things. So as I brought up before, types of risk. So cyber breach computing infrastructure failure, unavailability of key vendors, loss of utilities, environmental and social are the areas to look into, but they aren't the only ones. It's being able to sit down and be somewhat creative about what those risks are, specifically to what your business would do. You know, I worked in a business that you know, about a decade ago was doing water tanks, and that was an area that you know, was doing very well and there were government incentives out there. But one of those risks that they had that they were actually looking at over time was removal of those government incentives. You know, how would that impact the business? Would their business have you know, overnight go from doing well to not doing very well at all? So even you know, whether it be legislative or you know, grants or whatever, there are a number of impacts to the business that you need to take into account and that needs to be fed into your you know business continuity planning process just to make sure that you are dealing with it and as uh, you know, was said the flow on effects you know, when you're looking at the riots over in America as an example you've got flow on effects there with you know mobile networks that are going down due to overloading you know logistics or issues with transit because streets are blocked and police are closing things down. So it's not just the initial risk of, you know, what would happen if we had a riot, for example, or in this case, we've had a pandemic that's led to a, a number of riots that's led to a whole lot. So there are a number of flow on effects from those risks and you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you think the one thing will save you, it probably isn't going to, you know, if you think that you've uploaded everything, you know, into the cloud, into a practice management suite in the cloud, and you think that they're going to be looking after you, you know, they may have a data center that goes down. What are you going to do if, they've, if they have it go down? You know, there's not going to be much of an opportunity to go and sue them if your business gets closed because you haven't been able to operate for a month. It's certainly something to think about. Yeah, it's, it's always fun trying to evaluate risks. I've been in situations where we've doing, been doing this in the financial industry. And one of the funniest things I ever saw, not one of our projects, but a project that we knew somebody was migrating data center equipment. They had everything done according to schedule. Everything was going to plan beautifully. What happened was they only had one set of keys for the truck. That set of keys was dropped accidentally down a stormwater drain and it disappeared into a two or three feet of uh, silt down the bottom of the drain. The whole project got held up for a few hours while they had to find a road crew to go and rescue the keys so they could get back on track. You know, a lot of the risks are hard to actually imagine but you really do need to step back and sort of think, well, anything that could have an impact, doesn't matter how silly it is, it could be a risk. And it might not be your environment, it could be the neighbor's environment if their building's on fire or some other issue like that. You always need to you know, think outside of the box a bit, but consider weird things happening because they do. That's exactly right. It's amazing what sort of things pop up, certainly during projects. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about during project management is having a back out plan for those times where it just hasn't gone the way you expect it to and you actually need to take steps backwards in order to get back to where you were. And that's a, you know, most people think, seem to think that things will keep progressing, but that's not always the case. You know, like you say, it could be a set of keys that you've dropped down a drain that you know, eventually halt things, but you know, 
planning for things not going well is certainly, I guess, should be the norm, not the exception. So business impact analysis. Now that we've got a bunch of risks, we need to look at you know, what'll, you know, what does the business do and what sort of impacts can it take? And two of the things, I guess, the an acronyms to look at here are restore time objective and restore point objective. This is how we look at impacts on a particular system, whether that be you know, your practice management suite, emails, telephones, files on a file server, you know, even files on a laptop. We look at the two things of restore time objective. That is how long it takes to get back up and running and you know, unfortunately it is very difficult to be instantaneous you know we can have high availability but in the event of things failing and falling over if we have to restore from some backup medium it does take time i had a manufacturing organization that had about five million drawings that they were trying to put back after being hacked and that took them a full day to get back up and running. And that was a good outcome. They had very fast backup servers and putting 5 million drawings back on their production servers in a day was actually pretty quick. Uh, on the flip side, I've had a law firm that had to unencrypt their crypto locked files and they had about a million files and that took them four weeks to do, to run the decryption algorithm. So, you know, being able to restore back makes a difference and that time needs to be factored in. You know, can you last for four hours as things are being restored? Can it be a day? Can it be two days? And restore point objective, that's basically how much data you will have to lose uh, there are backups out there that will be up to date, but maybe that backup's got issues. Maybe you have to go back three or four backups in order to get there. At what, which point is that not going to be a feasible thing for your business? You know, some of the examples listed there are telephones. You know, a restore time objective of four hours and a restore point objective of zero hours. Effectively, if your telephone system goes down, it could be a network fault. So we're not restoring any data to it. So your RPO can be zero hours. And if you're on a managed link like a fiber through Telstra, they have an RTO of four hours. So normally that's your restore time objective for them to go out and fix that fault. Sometimes it takes longer and you may not meet that window. And sometimes it's quicker. But uh, if you're on NBN as an example, if you've got a consumer NBN connection to your business, you have a restore time time objective of 72 hours three business days for them to actually restore that and that's something to keep in mind that you know if you if you can't run without phones for you know for three days what will you do and that's been something that a lot of businesses you know don't really factor in when they're going out and getting telecommunications you know, products what is their restore time objective you know what are their thresholds for that do they have any and it's something you want to break down into systems for your business as well, not necessarily just look at your business as a whole. And you really need to factor in the right balance between you know, the time it's going to take to get that data back and how often it's backed up and how much that costs to do that. You know, the amount of businesses I've gone into and you go, oh, how long can you be down for? And they go, oh, we can't. And it's sort of like, well, we can get you up and running, but it's going to be, say, $150,000 for this 10 person business and they go, we can't afford that. And then the question is, well, how long can you really be down for? It's often we find out that, you know, if we can answer phones, we can take notes and we can be up and running in three or four days. And now we have a realistic time frame to work with, but you really need to sit down and figure out what it means to your business and what that impact is and what that cost is. And, you know, there are a number of calculators out there and we can sit down with businesses and work that out from the cost of lost staff productivity through the reputational damage to your business done and what it's going to cost for a fairly large event. And as we pointed out earlier, those large events uh, happen more often than not. And it's a 50-50 between an event lasting less than a day or longer than a day. Incident response. So this is probably the bit that people are probably most in, most interested in is what do we do when something does happen? We believe there are four parts that you need to work through an incident response plan to ensure that everything can be actioned in the right way. And the first one is having a plan activation criteria. That is, you know, when do we activate it? Next one is having the right team of people to make sure that you can respond to the incident. Having a communications plan to communicate to 
the business, the board, the world, your vendors, your clients, and what you're, what you're saying to them and when you're saying it and how you're saying it. And last one is having a testing and evaluation as part of that so that you can go through this incident response plan and ensure that you can actually run. And as it says there, don't forget to communicate the plan to everyone. All of your business needs to know what will happen so that you know, if something pops up, someone can notify the right people on the incident response team so that they can sit down and work out through their activation criteria or they know what they need to do in the event of something going wrong there's a lot of moving parts in these and if everyone knows what they're doing things tend to run a lot smoother especially if you've tested it on a reasonably frequent basis so the activation criteria i guess this comes down to who makes the decision uh, in businesses i've worked with it usually comes down to a committee of three or four individuals and they work together to sit down and figure out is this going to be a disaster are we activating the incident response plan um, this can be used for a number of areas including security breaches that are becoming pretty common these days you know is this a breach and therefore do we activate what we normally do under a specific breach now you can keep these plans pretty general and just work through what's there or you can become pretty specific if it's a you know, if it's an action that's likely to happen you know frequently it's probably good to map down what the specific points you'd run through for that type of incident you know a security breach might be one that's you know, reasonably specific enough that you'd actually have a data breach plan specifically for it and the steps that were there but with incident planning in any disaster if you have a good plan in place with the right people in the plan it doesn't matter what pops up it's all being able to sit down and work through each of those things and i guess as matthew has said it's you know things happen. You know, you're probably not going to guess what's going to happen. They're going to happen. And having a flexible plan makes that a little bit easier. And that's where we come to triggers for activation. You know, is it a government declaration of a pandemic? You know, is it a suspicion of a breach? Maybe it's a something very black and white, like the power's out. Or is there a human resource impact? You know, is there something like that happened when I was working at the financial institution that we literally saw what was happening and it came to us that our you know, activation trigger was the fact that we couldn't get staff home at the end of the day. And that was what we used to activate that plan itself. So the next one is the incident response team. Uh, this is, I guess, the makeup of this team needs to be able to cover a number of areas in the business and that's the authority to make the decisions that affect the entire business you know you can't just have your you know your managing partner who is there who can make all those responsibilities but has very little knowledge and you know authority in the other areas to get things done or if you're in an organization that's got a number of partners that you'd normally run things across all these partners well that's probably not going to work in the event of an incident you can't have everyone as part of the response team it's just not feasible so this is where you'd have say one person who is responsible for the authority to make those decisions and green light what needs to happen and a team of people there to support them and as it's stated at the bottom plan and train for the de delegation of authority uh, maybe that person's not there maybe that's the incident that we're planning for is there's been something that's gone wrong you know there's been a bus crash or something on the way to an event and a number of staff have been injured and that's your incident uh, we certainly need to think that things aren't necessarily going to go to plan and what would happen if they did and i guess plan for those opportunities as well yeah i can but, i can really encourage people to think about that. I've actually been Johnny on the spot during a uh, crisis when uh, we had a, a uh, incident happen in the financial industry and uh, delegation of authorities, simply I was the, the most senior IT guy there and I wasn't even a manager at that stage. You know, it was just more or less, hey, you're IT, we need someone to make, make some decisions. And it's, you need to train people to step up for those sort of things. So that was part of our routine when we practiced our recovery plans, those sort of things. People needed to know about the plans. They needed to know that if need be, they have to be the one who grabs that and starts running it. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's scary for people to say, yeah, okay, you know, I don't care who you are, your help desk or whatever you are, you'll now have to sit down and work with the CEO or work with these executives to actually create an outcome or achieve an outcome. It really is important to 
have, be prepared to delegate and to make sure that you support your staff in that and get them to understand that, you know, look, it's a natural process. We need to get through an incident. Let's come together. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, whether that be the financial authority, you know, maybe it's the CFO that would normally be the one signing the checks at that point in time, you know, or whether it ends up being just someone in accounts who has delegated that authority at that time, you know, they may be signing checks for numbers they'd never thought they'd ever do. And they'd be worried about the implications of that. And it can weigh heavily on them. But, you know, it's, this is what happens in these sort of scenarios it's never as smooth and easy as you expect and having the necessary you know, operational, technical and financial authority and knowledge there to be able to get things moving. And that's the whole point of what we're trying to do is actually keep the business moving through these things so that it comes out the other side. It's that you know, being paralyzed by fear of making the wrong decision that's going to end up causing issues to pop up. Uh, there's only so long a business can be down and not answering phones or not running or you know not dealing with something that's happened before there's you know significant costs that pop in and you know an example there of a law firm that we worked with and their COVID COVID-19 response and some of the decisions they made and the first one was being able to close that office quite quickly and creating the reoccupation plan they knew that something would happen at some point that they'd have to go back and being able to you know, start building that plan. And then when the COVID safe guidelines came out, factoring those in and adjusting the plan to suit, you know, purchasing hardware. In this case, it was a firewall for them to allow VPN to their servers for the remote workers to get in. And, you know, it was an adjustment that, you know, never had staff that were working out of the office. They were just in the one office. So being able to adjust to what was pretty much a, a new situation, getting phones answered outside, getting staff working outside, it all needed to be factored in. And there were costs that they hadn't, you know, hadn't factored and hadn't even thought of that popped up as part of it. And then being able to sit there and provide the necessary infection control you know, booklets to staff to educate them on what they needed to do you know, when they were outside of the office from home to be able to protect themselves. The staff for them were a massive asset and making sure that they were looking after themselves and their families so that they could come back into the office and work through you know, the incident at the time. And that's something that needs to be part of that. You know, you do have a number of assets and your staff are a big one and making sure that things are covered for them. It's not just servers and, and buildings, it's you know, the people that work in them. And that goes on to the communications plan. And this comes down to who is responsible for communicating and who isn't. You, know, you want to make sure that the right people are saying the right things during these situations. You know, I'm sure we can go online and see what's being said on Twitter now and you know, each has their own opinion on what's right and what's wrong. But if one person's saying it and it's a consistent message from your business, it comes across a lot better than if multiple people are saying fragmented things. So making sure that if someone is responsible for that, you know, they have the authority and the responsibility to get that job done. And then what information are they communicating? Does it need to be run past the team? You know, how does that process work and how do you get that out there? And to whom is the next one? You know, you have your board, your managers and your staff internally to you, but you also have your clients. You also have your suppliers. And depending on what it is, you have either emergency services or government departments. You know, if you've had a breach, you might have to you know, be notified that you've had a security breach and actually go through that notification part. And that also may mean ringing up your, you know, any of your insurance firms and talking to them. That actually may be part of this. So it's being able to sit down and figure out, you know, what do you say to whom and when? And the other one is where, you know, where do you post that message? You know, are you ringing people up? Are you doing a news bulletin? Is it on your LinkedIn, you know, on your website? How do you get that message out to those different groups? And that's part of your communications plan. So you have a good understanding of, you know, what you need to do in that and who you need to talk to as part of what's going on. And this is probably to me the biggest, most critical part of an incident response plan, testing and evaluating your plan. Now, it sounds pretty twee, but you know, you don't know how you're going to react until you put through that. It's, you know, you're better off to have tested it and put yourself through, you know, a number of different disaster scenarios than to wait for the real one to come along and to not know how you're going to go. And as Matthew said, you know, being able to get those staff who 
get delegated up to that level and putting them through these, it gives them a chance to become more comfortable working with those others and get a bit of a feel. And if you're doing it on a regular basis, you know, everyone in the business gets to understand you've got to, you know, you've got to go through these, you've got to try a few and you've got to feed that back in. You know, this is a very much a, uh, a living document and it will adjust over time. And we do recommend that people carry these out frequently. We do it every quarter and we sit down and go through, you know, what would happen if we lost a data center? You know, if we got a security breach, we've been through floods before, you know, what happens if we had another one of those, you know, what are the disasters we'd go through and then just to run through one. So things that happen on a weekend and people would know what would be going on and they would understand it and they know where they fit into that and things you know, maybe not work like clockwork, but we can certainly get them to a point where they're reasonably polished and feed those things back in. And it like, it builds up the comfort so that people do know what's going on. So that was the incident response planning. And now let's talk a little bit about backing up your data. You know, I think this is probably fundamental to, you know, from a technological point of view anyway, that your data is a very valuable asset and the a big part of the business continuity is making sure you have backups there. You can have systems in place to stop things going down, high availability as they call it, which makes sure that things are running in the event of an outage. Uh, if you look at Microsoft Office 365 as an example, they tend to keep your email on five separate servers globally, which covers them in the event of a server going down, a data center going down, and ensures that you've got email, but it is only highly available. They don't actually back up your data as a tip there, and they will tell you to back up your data. So high availability is certainly a part and parcel of not having an issue happen, but inevitably something may, and being you know, in a situation where you have backups of your data is an important place to be. And the first rule of backup club is three copies of your data, at least three copies at least two of those on different storage media and at least one of them located outside of your office. That way you cover yourself. Uh, for example, you know, we recommend people use disk to disk to cloud where they have a separate backup appliance that backs up any local data to that. And then that pushes it off again to the cloud that keeps it in two different storage mediums and they're covered with an offsite backup. And being that they don't have to change tapes, we take the human factor out of it, which does make it a little bit better. And you can automate a number of checks on that data as well, including full restores. The older way to do it, and is still prevalent in some organizations, is just to just to tape, where we're backing it up to tape and taking those tapes offsite. Um, but you can pretty much use anything that does cover those three rules. It really is less about the technological way to do it and more about ensuring that you are doing it and you are making sure that those rules are there. And you know, remember, it's not so much the backup that we're trying to achieve here. It's to get that data back in the event of something happening. So uh, as per client two, I talked about earlier, the retail firm who had a crypto locker incident and they were backing up their data to tapes and they th thought they were in a good position because those backups were completing. You know, they didn't realize that the tapes wouldn't restore at all for them and we couldn't get the data to restore off the tapes. They never once done a restore. And you know, it's just a case of when things actually were needed, you know, it just didn't work. It had never been tested and it didn't work. And, you know, we want to make sure that backups aren't just being backed up, but backups are restorable. And because of that, we need to make sure that we are testing those restores. And that includes full server restores as well, not just a file or two, so that we can get things back up. And data reduction and deduplication. You know, businesses these days are accumulating a huge amount of data and not all of it is actually necessary to running the business. And often there's a number of copies of the same thing. So being able to sit down and go through what data you have, making sure you're backing up only what you actually need to back up to keep running. And in the case of some things, making sure you're backing up all of what you need to keep running as well. Um, there is the balance there between not enough and too much. And at the same time, you can get systems that will deduplicate a lot of that data too. So if you do have multiples of files, that it shouldn't be too much of an issue. 
and there should only be one source of truth for the data. Um, what I mean by that is you don't want to have multiple copies of the same thing in different areas. So you don't know which one's the right one. You want it to be coming from a single source so that you know that that is the data that you should be backing up. And the biggest one that I see having issues with, and I'm sure Matthew's had similar ones as well, is people who don't encrypt their backups and then lose one of their backup drives or tapes with all of their data on it. And that you know, unfortunately happens a fairly large amount. And we recommend that that's a, you know, whether, whether that data is stored in the cloud or wherever it's encrypted through its transit and where it lies and rests so that you, at any point in time, you know that your data is protected. Yeah, I love, I love that bit. Yeah, a lot of data breaches over the last few years have been through exposed backups in the cloud where they simply have failed to test that it's actually protected correctly and quite often unencrypted. But I absolutely love your tip down the bottom there, Dave. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I have seen that a few times. It's almost as bad as people writing their password on their computer and sticking it on the front with a post-it note. Please do not put passwords on pieces of paper stuck to what their password protected with. I can't stress that enough. It happens far too often. If your password's that hard to remember, there's a problem with your password. So, yes. Moving on. So, don't forget... When it comes to backups, don't forget the location of your data. Uh, as an example, Microsoft 365, I will stress this again and again. If you're using Office 365 and you are putting your data in the cloud, they do not back it up. You need to buy third-party products to get your data backed up. And the same applies for Xero as well. If you're backing up your data into Xero, they do not back it up. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Xero is going to fall over or Office 365 is going to fall over any time. Although you know, I know that Google and, and Microsoft have actually lost client data before and it does happen and there's not a lot they can do about it. But, you know, what happens if you get a virus? What happens if someone gets into your Office 365 tenancy and zips everything up? If you don't have a backup, you are pretty screwed, to be honest. And that is why you need to have a third-party backup product. And specifically, if you're targeting off Office 365, do not select a backup product that uses Microsoft's own Azure servers to back up to. Back it up somewhere else. There are products that back up to their own data centers to make sure that they aren't going to be um, included in any issues that may happen when Microsoft's data centers could go down. And for Xero, there are backup products around the world for backing up Xero. So it's definitely worth having a look at those to check that your data doesn't go anywhere. And you know, it may just be that somebody somewhere logs on and accidentally deletes it or on purpose deletes it or something like that happens and, you know, their services don't actually have a failure. You know, what do you do in that? Because it's been effectively your fault. So having a backup of those things certainly just covers you in case anything happens. Local servers and their data is sort of a bit of a no-brainer. I'd like to think that anyone that's still using a server on their premise to host their software, whether they're using Sage or you know, whether it's just for files or whatever it is, you know, backing that up certainly is something that should be happening regardless. Um, as I said about cloud-based cloud services, even if you don't have access to a third-party backup product for them, at least ask those cloud-based services, what are they doing to back up your data? What are their RTOs and RPOs? And you know, how long do they keep that data for? Is it backed up for just seven days? You know, even if we're talking about your website, is your website backed up? Are you putting those backups anywhere? Are you keeping them for longer than a week? You know, what is going on? Interesting to go and get those answers and make sure that you are covering your own um, own compliance and your own internal processes to ensure that you are protecting your risks to your data. Even if you've outsourced those risks to someone else, you just need to know what they're doing for you. And portable media laptops and desktops. So not all data on these things need to be backed up, but sometimes they do. I've come across, you know, CEOs and managing partners who have used laptops and have kept stuff on there that they probably shouldn't have in the first place and have lost the laptop and said important data or the laptops just died or it's been run over or a bunch of other things and being able to make sure that you've you know, located the critical data and you've backed it up is certainly important. So don't forget those other things and portable media can include things like USB keys as well since um, I'm sure Matthew's got a bunch of stories of those going walkabout with the valuable data on since that happens ludicrously often. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one, meet re regulatory requirements. You know, 
you've obviously got data retention for different types of your data that you have to keep around, whether that be for privacy and confidentiality, whether it be for financial records, whether you're contracted to a client and you have to keep their data, you know, make sure that you are actually covering those things off and don't leave unprotected backups anywhere. Um, they're, uh, as Matthew says, there has been a number of breaches of data left in the cloud. I've certainly seen a number of big companies who have used online services and put their data there and then, you know, forgotten it. Six months later, they've stopped using said service and that data has been breached, whether that be as simple as a client list that you had in a CRM that you tried out through to actually using a backup service and it's a full backup of your data. Uh, make sure you do know where you are putting your data and if you are removing it or removing a service, make sure that data is actually removed and checking with those providers so that you aren't leaving data hanging around that could come back and bite you at some point in the future. Are there any tips from you, Matthew, that you could enlighten us with that people may not remember? I think you've done a pretty good job there of uh, covering it all, David. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always a challenge there are a few things to be concerned about, um, especially these days. USB keys used to be you know, something that people use a lot. Personally, I don't really use them too often anymore. But um, even things like the data that's on your phone, you know, quite often you save data onto your phone, but onto the SD card of your phone. Now, your phone might be pin protected, but what about the SD card? So if you do lose your phone, somebody could take that card out and read it and get access to the information on there. Now you should be looking at, you know, is it possible to encrypt that SD card? So I obviously have an SD card in my laptop, or not so obviously, but I do. And I make sure that that is actually encrypted. And I do make a very good, decent effort of trying to segregate all the data on my laptop so that I know what's critical on there. There's a huge amount of fluff that I just don't care. Laptop dies or loses, it, that's okay. But it's only that real critical little kernel of stuff in a particular folder I keep that I make sure I back up every single night. Because one of the threats that uh, I know you can get with a laptop is the recovery key. I've had my laptop start up a couple of times and say, hey, I need the recovery key to even boot the laptop. Thankfully, I know better than that. So I do have copies of those offline. So I can actually get past that. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a massive amount of effort, but I've certainly been through a lot of these things that David's been speaking of. I've uh, seen a lot of things as well. So I uh, go through New Zealand quite a lot for business, and I know in Christchurch, with the earthquakes there, it was a similar experience in a way to COVID-19, where all of a sudden people are no longer going into the city. They're working from home. It was something that they had not planned on and something that, we, you know, we've not planned on all this COVID-19 business, but how prepared companies were to take these sort of risks on or take these events on and simply keep the doors open. I do, I do actually uh, appreciate the fact that you guys, you know, that based in Brisbane, you've got a brilliant story around this, you know, the once in a hundred year flood that happened every couple of years with the uh, river flooding there in Brisbane city. It's something that it's amazing. It, it can easily catch you out. And just simply keeping the doors open to the business is one of the most fundamental things that you should be doing. And certainly David's spoken about the need to practice these sort of things, sit down, work them through, run through the processes and think, oh, wow, how there's a gap in that process. You know, we didn't think of something. That's why you exercise it to try and make sure that, you know, you pick those gaps up that you understand and that people are aware of the, the information and that's required to keep the business open and to simply, you know, how to recover things. 100% agree on that one. And I know being in Queensland, we certainly have a number of weather events. So it's you know, fairly monotonous how often these things happen and the amount of times we've had hail go through and the CBDs you know, being trashed, cars have been trashed and it's just part and parcel of living in Queensland. And that's probably at the lower end of things that happen. And, it just it's a fact of life it's a reality you know there is no guarantees in all of this and it's being able to make sure that you've got a plan to work through and keep on working through that so that you can meet whatever challenge pops up and sometimes it's just that creativity to to deal with it so it's just yeah it's just part of running a business i guess i've had to deal with you know a whole bunch of issues running my business and that's just you know where we are if you're not prepared to deal with the issues, you probably won't be in business particularly long. So you know, this is just another one of those and being able to have a bit of a process to work through certainly makes things easier. 
Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I think, you know, a lot of people think backing up data and those sort of things, talking about backups is boring. Yeah, you know, it is, honestly. But, hey, it's, it's critical, you know, backing up your business, your data, knowing how to keep your business running. It's, it, you, you need to do it. It is part of, uh, I guess, an essential process in keeping your business vital and alive. David, I just wanted to ask you and Matt, you as well, um, a real quick question. When you um, run the scenarios that you were talking about, do you actually uh, do it kind of, I'm going to say like a fire drill? In other words, do you ever do these scenarios where you actually create a situation as if it was real so that you get the reaction and the results on that um, in reality from the people that would be having to deal with that in a work environment or do they tend to be uh, kind of um, more contained in terms of watching the outcomes of one of those? It, for us, it depends on the scenario. So if we know that we're not going to have any client impact, we will run it like it's a real one. So you know, if it's a data breach, it'll be just a matter of dropping a few files in a directory or, or trying something like that to see how they will react. And that is, you know, we do do it once a quarter and we do things like that. If it's something like the data center going down, we will actually shut the data center down, but we'll make sure that things are running. So no clients are impacted as part of it, but the exercises still run like it would be a live one where it had gone and it'd just be something we would do more after the fact than, you know, as part of it. And it's just purely the, the testing. So, you know, a bit of, I guess, smarts when choosing that, but yeah, definitely surprise people by looking like a real one and seeing how they go. At some point you'll notify them that it's, you know, just a scenario, but even just getting them to set off so that they can start enacting things is a very good way to test that they have some, you know, grasp of, of this process. Yeah, absolutely. In the, in the financial industry, which is, uh, I guess, the core of my background, we not only had, I guess, roundtable exercises where we sat down and we just went through various scenarios at a high level, made sure we got the running plans, find out, you know, sort of how these things would flow. But the reality is you can't test it unless you do it. And I, in the financial industry, we absolutely used to test one major event every single year and we'd test maybe, you know, one or two minor events. So the major event would be, yes, we've lost our core building, the CBDs down. We need to converge onto our backup site, our disaster recovery site, and actually bring those systems up, bring them online and make sure that people know how to get them operating. And part of that process was when there was a key person, they would purposely say, okay, you're not allowed to be involved in this because you're on holiday for this event or you're stuck somewhere else, you can't help. And so I've been that guy where, you know, I know exactly what they need to do, but I have to keep stum, just be quiet and watch other people run through the processes that I've actually written on how to get my infrastructure up. So you can't really know until you test it. So talking about it and planning it is essential, but so is actually doing it. Um, I, absolutely, you can't afford to disrupt people or disrupt your business, but you do need to actually test the plans. And then I guess it identifies the gaps that you can kind of pick up and do something with, not least of which training in the case we hear, you know, a lot about for cybersecurity issues in particular, um, really critical as well there. So thanks again, folks, and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jerry.